talk about um, uh, investment without exploitation, and then you gave the analogy or talked about uh, how we can trade with Sweden fairly, but not Africa fairly. But uh, if we could exploit Sweden, or we being Norwegian companies, of course they would do it if they could, but they don't because uh, Norway has enough economic clout to stop that from happening. Um, so I think uh, if you say to just Norwegian companies, oh, you have to invest and not exploit, it's a little bit naive because I mean, it's capitalism. They're going to get the most out of it they can. Uh, I think a, a better way of approaching it is to see how can African countries flex their muscle to a point to where Western companies can't exploit them. And you mentioned uh, Hugo Chavez, for example, uh, when he nationalized oil, everyone whined about that. But, you know, in the end, what are they going to do? Uh, you could see at that point that he had more power than the companies. And another example would be in the early uh, labor movement in the United States. Um, when the working class was strongest in the United States was when the unions were most aggressive. When they started to work with the uh, bosses and corporations, and then you have the 1980s with the, now they're almost nothing. So I think uh, this idea that, um, you know, that you just have to, companies have to be nicer is, is not going to work. Um, yeah, question. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, what do you think about that? Short questions, okay? <laughs> or short comments? Yes, I'm Alexander. I'm a master's student at UMB at the International Relations Program. And my question is basically about uh, tackling disparity because we've heard from most of the panelists here that we see Africa, which is growing, where there is kind of a good economic growth. Like seven, seven out of ten is the fastest growing economy in the world, actually. So I would like to maybe perhaps in particular Javier and Fred and also the economists challenge you on. How do you kind of tackle this disparity? How, how do you make the investments kind of flow on? You, do you work from a trickle-down logic, or how do you kind of ensure that this growth is, uh, is also benefiting the whole of the population, which seems like one of the key issues there? Thank you. I think mine is a comment and then some a word of thanks really to, to the University International Student Union and presenters. Uh, my comment, I think we all agree with the factors that made Africa to be in the situation where it is now. And the theme is very great. I really appreciate the presenters. They are doing better than the politicians. Uh, <coughs> There are so many things if I just want to talk about them, but let me say uh, I have not had three things which I feel are very important in the whole thing. Uh, internal factors which are part of the legacy are really the biggest factor as we speak because some governments have had their independence. Some are very rich with natural resources like Nigeria, but not necessarily doing good because of those policies. Maybe the companies investing there are not Africans. And I think this is very much to do with the continuation of colonialism and capitalism and so forth. And Africa has not rise up to protect their interests. External policies, uh, regional organization, AU. If I talk about AU, AU have not adjusted to the challenges in the region. If there are crises in any of the countries between two countries or one, AU will embrace certain policies. Until lately, in the expense of human rights, and that is part of internal or AU is mimicking, is, is imitating policies of uh, centuries ago. Uh, colonialism maybe has gone politically. And I think there, there are key words in this. 
political control and economic control. Maybe Africans have had their political control, but they do not have an economic control. I am a well bank. Their conditions cannot be met by an African country. And these are, okay, these are things to do with Africa. Africa has got SADC, has got East Africa, has got all kinds of regional organizations, economic or political, but they are not adjusting to the challenges. This is not to express the hopelessness, as, as, as my brother from Ethiopia said. <clears throat> there are African individuals or groups adjusting and, and inventing in Kenya and in Uganda, they are there. Now, in the case of South Sudan, where uh, a wonderful lady has presented very well, and I think the way forward for me in this uh, presentation is what, what is the way forward? The way forward is that human factor is the most important factor in all this. Because I know European countries, the majority have got oil or gas. It is very few, but it is a human resource. And I think up to today, Germany still leads, despite the difficulties they are in. <clears throat> Germany did not have a special talent from the rest. Maybe they have embraced a very practical approach to human development, like developing academic with technical education together. That is what we don't have in Africa. And if there is an opportunity, like myself from South Sudan, I'm the ambassador of South Sudan. South Sudan will benefit from this kind of uh, team. Why? Because it's a Persian country. And South Sudan will be able to benefit if a country like Norway, which is friendly to South Sudan, can embrace and listen to people of South Sudan, what do they need? <clears throat> and embrace policies that are objective because South Sudan, I can say today, is a country which is ruled by an NGO because we have so many NGOs operating in South Sudan. Some are even powerful than the government. <laughs> they are there to help South Sudan make a step forward, but if they continue helping South Sudan and dictating, South Sudan will be an NGO state and that will not help. <laughs> I entirely agree with the theories that I expressed today. They are relevant and they are insincere. And I think this is a Nordic tradition. A Nordic tradition, if I was in the UK, I would not really have an opportunity to listen to the details that the presenters have made because that is not their tradition. Okay, last, last thing. Now China, in 90s or 80s, no one was talking about China. It was Russia versus US. But as we speak today, China is economic power. And China is investing in Africa. I don't speak China. Either my European African don't listen or hear any word from Chinese. We can communicate with European more than any other part of the world. But I, can, I, have, I have never seen a European company building a road infrastructure in Africa. Is it not a missed opportunity for Europeans? China have their own misgiving. Maybe they don't, they don't want to know a local Tanzanian working as a laborer. They bring their workers all over China which is denying the local people the job. <clears throat> it, is, it, is, it doesn't conform to social responsibility. I don't know whether China respects the environment, and I think they have that documented in the world debate about, about, about environment. Therefore, a country like Norway, which is very rich and free, and have a greater influence lately, has opportunity to come to Africa and make changes by accepting the theories that are expressed today by individual politicians. And I think I'm very happy to be part of this and I will continue to be part of this as I'm around here. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Please be short. Uh, with the responses. Can we respond to all of you? We beg you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do agree with you. Is it all? Yeah. Yes. I do agree with you. It was very naive. But uh, I think, uh, first of all, we can, we can encourage better international rules and regulations for, for instance, what is a bribe. Uh, which is important. And second, uh, the examples I gave were government, Norwegian government uh, companies, organizations, such as Startoil, Norfund, Green Resources was sponsored, you know, with 60 million, and is still being sponsored by the embassy in, in, in Tanzania. So uh, the Norwegian government have a possibility to influence a number of these companies, or is directly involved and don't really seem to care about uh, doing it nice. So I, I think that that is uh, important. Uh, you, uh, the, the second one uh, asked about uh, uh, illustrating uh, the, the growth, and I agree with you that there's a lot of changes. But I think uh, we are kind of measuring wrong, because uh, part of the measurement is on the international export going out of the developing countries in Africa. And that has increased because huge amounts of copper is being exported from uh, Malawi and several other countries, the Zambia, yeah, and, uh, and uh, Tanzanite gold and so on from Tanzania, and oil from South Sudan and what have you. And this, of course, increases the, the um, gross national product and, and so on. But there is hardly any new industry being started. That creates uh, uh, workplaces for, for people there. And with half of the population in several African countries under 14 years of age, there's an enormous need for more jobs. So one of the things that we should do in Norway was to encourage our companies to go to Africa and start factories. Even factories for uh, things that are needed there. And, uh, and do it nice. Pay the minimum or more than the minimum wages uh, pay our taxes and, and, and do a decent job. Thank you. Okay. I, I want to address two things, uh, Aid, and then uh, there was a question about uh, trickle down growth, growth or, or how economic growth happens. I, I think it's uh, easy to, uh, well, we have a tendency to exaggerate the importance of Norway in the world and what we can do. and. Uh, we are, after all, very small. And also to exaggerate the importance of aid to what it can uh, can do, uh, both in terms of negative things and, and positive things. I mean, here, Fred here has talked about lots of, let's say, negative uh, aspects of aid. And you talked about some of the positive things. And it's easy to point to projects which have achieved great things, uh, aid, aid projects. and. Uh, Perhaps some of the, the changes in health, improvements in health and education can be attributed to aid. But uh, researchers have tried to find effects of aid on the growth of poor countries. Do countries that get more aid grow faster? And it's impossible to find that effect. There is no growth effect of aid. That's what comes out of the, uh, these studies. Uh, if countries uh, think that aid is negative, it's possible for them to do, follow the example of India. India has said, we only want uh, aid from the four biggest donors. We don't want aid from Norway because it's too much hassle. Any African country can do that tomorrow if it so wishes, any African government. So uh, they have to take responsibility, I think, for, you know, if, if they say, if they don't want to take that decision, it's not easy because they don't want to take it. They want to have the aid. And then we can discuss why they want to do that if it has all the negative side effects that we had heard. Uh, the question about trickle down or, or growth, it creates the, the picture of, of uh, I mean you have heard this, uh, this, uh, this word, and it creates an Im the image of uh, as growth as something that happens up there somewhere. So the president creates some growth and he allows some of it to trickle down somehow. But that's not how economic growth happens. It happens because people in that country they work and produce more. That's what economic growth is. They create more value. And the distribution of that value depends on how that was created. 
It could be, as in Equatorial Guinea, which has been one of the fastest growing countries in the world and based primarily on oil that's pumped up in the sea, and most of that income accrues to the ruling elite. The president and his son have become fabulously wealthy. And that doesn't create much in terms of improvement of living standards of people. Or it could happen because people are employed in, let's say, in labor-intensive textile factories, like we heard a case of, employing lots of people sewing things. Or it could be, like has happened in Zambia, lots of people starting growing uh, cotton on their small farms and getting extra income and creating wealth from that. And of course, what way it happens has a very big influence on distribution of income in the country. So uh, it's not only about, say, mean uh, GDP per capita, but it's how, how it's distributed, and that depends on how it was generated. Sorry, uh, that was also what my question was, before you tackle the economic disparity. So that's basically my question. Who, who is responsible for tackling this economic disparity? Is it, is it the, the investors which are setting these conditions, or should it come from within? That's basically what I was wondering about. I think the president of Equatorial Guinea has to take some responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> we are coming here from the summer. Uh, I, I just want to respond to the, the, the concern raised about the aid. Is it important or not? Uh, uh, I, I think uh, I very much agree with Fred with the practice, how, uh, how it is being done, with all the things that you presented uh, 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 in learned. But um, uh, generally saying no to aid is, uh, is like me, is uh, no to sharing what you have. Uh, because there are some interesting things happening. Uh, some some, some projects contributing to uh, bigger change. Uh, that, that is some of the things that we need to look at. Uh, like for example, uh, if I just take a simple example in, in the seed sector, uh, what we see, the trend is now uh, uh, industrial countries, so to, see, so to speak, uh, the seed companies are pushing to uh, harmonize, harmonize regulations around seed, seed, national seed regulations, plant variety uh, protection, uh, and patents, uh, so that they have intellectual property rights on the resources that farmers have have, have kept for generations, have taken care of for generations, and monopolize that, and create dependency of farmers on their companies, so that they buy seeds, every single planting seed, which is unfair, because this is a generation, uh, the effect of generations uh, in it, and it was kept there, and the knowledge is attached to it, and they are still doing it. And at the same time, we see, like, you, if you look at a farmer, he's an entrepreneur, uh, he look at cost benefit, <coughs> at the same time doing so many things that institutions uh, around uh, an agriculture sector are doing. He is doing breeding because he's selecting seed every, seed, every, every planting season. Uh, he is producing seed, he is distributing seed through gift, sale, exchange, uh, he, is, he, he is doing a lot of things that institutions like uh, breed, plant breeding institutions, seed uh, producing and the quality control institutions are doing. And what our program is doing is like building community seed banks that organize farmers so that they come together, produce seed and supply to their own community. And these are being taken by regional governments, for example, in Ethiopia. And they are investing their own money and building because it has demonstrated the reason. So those kinds of aids are also there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have to take some more questions so that the public here can take part. OK, we've got two hands here. The, the lady in the back there had a question first. Um, and then uh, Kasim.
Africa needs to solve their problems and we have to work on our problems. Um, and then you've talked a lot about how perhaps trade um, is a solution and now also investments. A lot of you have kind of concluded by saying, you know, to focus on perhaps just investments. Um, and I know that uh, Norway has started talking about how um, the oil fund is invested, like Fred mentioned, in um, developed countries. And we need to look towards developing countries and start uh, investing in developing countries. Uh, my question is kind of, um, uh, how do you do that? You know, is that the solution? And then how do you do that? Um, and, and how do you do that? And, but you want to avoid kind of what has happened with aid um, and the structural adjustment programs. You know, you want to ensure that it doesn't cause more corruption, um, but at the same time, you don't want to tell countries what to do, like with the structural adjustment programs. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's my question. You know, how, how can we do that? without telling countries exactly what to do, but at the same time, uh, time avoid corruption and going into the world. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, organizers for this uh, wonderful opportunity for people to discuss pertinent issues about Africa. <coughs> I might not end up asking a question. <laughs> I might end up presenting another paper. But uh, let me just touch on some few issues here. And uh, I'm afraid I wasn't uh, present when the first few speakers uh, presented. But I've heard uh, you know, what uh, most people have said. And uh, some, some, some people are raising the question as to whether aid is good or bad, or investment is good or bad. And to me, I don't think that's the question. The question here is how is that aid you know, being given and how is it utilized? Because most of the studies which have been done are doing a post-mortem of how aid you know, performed. And uh, they're not really giving us the real reasons why it failed or succeeded, or what we hear in most cases is that aid doesn't work. Yeah, it might be the, uh, the outcome of how it was given and how it was spent. But does it mean that then aid is not you know, required or is it not good? I think aid can be good if it's given in, in, uh, without uh, a hidden agenda. Okay, one, but also it's, it's used in a good governance kind of way. Somebody talked about, you know, Africa, you know, being generalized, and I think that is real. And I, 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 I agree. I mean, you don't have a homogeneous Africa. You do have, Africa is not a country. You do have countries in Africa. You have governments in Africa. And they have different levels of development. They have different you know, trajectories of democracy and all those kind of uh, aspects which might bring up, uh, about, you know, development. So, uh, uh, to me, I think uh, generalizing and putting Africa in one uh, basket, I, I think it's not, it's not right and it's not fair. So, when one talks about Africa, one has to be able to differentiate, you know, countries and uh, be able to say, okay, in Sub-Sahara, for example, or in this country, in that country, this doesn't work, but in that country it works. Because we have a lot of, you know, diversities in Africa. Now, Africa is both a victim, but also it has responsibility. Uh, the, uh, the ambassador here talked about internal and external factors making Africa, you know, what it is in general, okay? And uh, I'd like to say, yes, both internal factors and external factors account for the status here. Now, where do you put the weight most? 
to me, I, I fail to put a weight anywhere because every actor is important. When you talk about external factors, you're talking about, you know, the global agreements, talk about WTO, talk about when 19, 1970s, when we were talking about the new international economic orders, uh, order, you know, and UNCTA, what were they doing? They were fighting for fair trade, if you want. You know, GATT has evolved into w, uh, WTO now, and we have the Doha round stagnant. It's not moving. Why? That goes to, 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 to Fred's uh, question. Are we serious? Do we ask this question why Africa is, is still poor? What about the structures which we are putting around? Are they helping? I don't think so. When Africa is creating jobs for the developed countries because of the tariffs which the developing countries are putting into the exports of Africa and other developing countries, okay, don't export manufactured things. Just bring us your raw material. This is what we want. If you bring those, zero tariff. But if you just process it in one stage, there's <laughs> double tariff and things like that. So the world structure also puts, uh, uh, gives an indication of what uh, you, you guys have, have to do. There, there are a lot, a lot of uh, issues which we can, we, we can talk about, but I think that these have been known for quite some time. What is lacking, you know, uh, is the willingness to act they meant that by the major players in Africa, in you know most African countries, including my country, where I come from, where uh, Oiga talked about, Fred talked about, you know Tanzania, you know, uh, we have some governance issues, and people are talking about, okay, uh, where is the benefit of the resources we have? Carbon is coming here, but we don't see the benefit, so it's not new. Who does it act? Who's to blame? It's the local government, but also the investors. So it's both. If they're not willing to act in the right direction, then it, it will just end. Look at the in international agreements. What are they doing? They're having the way of, what is their intention? What is their intention? Well, I, I have a lot of questions, but I say I might not end up asking questions, but just sharing. Uh, some of my, my consent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Samuel Makoha. I'm a student of development studies. I'm a bachelor student. And uh, I'll just give a few comments. Uh, quite a number of people have said that we Africans should not look at ourselves as being victims. Indeed, I'm one of those Africans that think or believe or understand that we should stop being uh, regarded as victims, even if we know that the current problems we have in Africa started from the, uh, the, the Western powers that colonized Africa. You know. but. Many people also say that uh, Africa is growing at a very fast rate. I'll give you two examples of countries that are growing at a very fast rate. We have Kenya and we have Ghana. These countries previously had dictatorships. But what is it that is making them begin to grow at a very fast rate? Why is it that Botswana is at the development level that it is? And why is it that South Korea is at the level where it is? There is one lowest common factor in all these countries, and that is democracy. And when we look at democracy, I actually criticize the MDGs, uh, Millennium Development Goals, for ha not having included democracy as one of the uh, uh, goals to be achieved. Because we all know that where there is democracy, we have institutions being built. And when institutions are built, then we have reduction of things like corruption, we have reductions of things like coups, rebel activities, and these are factors that affect investments in many countries, especially on the African continent. Nobody is going to invest money 
in a country that they are not very certain of the political future. Who doesn't? Nobody wants to lose money. And in any case, people invest in countries that they are very sure they are going to make profits from. So the fact, uh, uh, the question uh, raised here is why is Africa poor? People don't make profit from poor people. They make profit from rich people. So we have the resources, uh, like somebody said, what we need to do is to produce finished goods, like Botswana is doing. Botswana produces finished diamonds. Now recently, Ghana, with its oil, had issues with the Americans. When the Americans came, they started cheating the Ghanaians over uh, uh, the amounts of oil shipped to America and the amounts of finished oil products that come, come back to Ghana. So when the minister raised the, an issue about that, the next time he wanted to travel to the US, the Americans denied him a visa. And they say that according to his, uh, 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 his history, they don't think that he will, he will be able to come back to Ghana. They will think that he will uh, go and, 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 and live in America as, a, as an illegal immigrant. <coughs> so the companies do not want us to, to, to know these things. But we can only negotiate on a stronger ground if we are democratic, if we have institutions, and where people are not bribed just for the sake of, of giving away all the profits that would arise from the resources that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We can uh, give uh, the word to the panelists again, like very short now, uh, to each of them who want to like, comment, and then we will see if we have one, the time for one more question. I have the mic, right. so I'm in charge here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to say to you from the Development Fund that of course your work is important and there are lots of good development aid projects. My point with the Kilombero thing was that there were local varieties of rice developed for 800 years that no Fund wiped out importing gene-modified modified Indian rice. And, and that is uh, my point. You're doing a great job. But let's stop our government organization shots as no fun from doing these stupid things. They need to hire people with some uh, ecological skills and some development skills, not only economists and lawyers. Uh, there was a question about how do you invest in a developed country? I'm not an economist, but I think you invest in the same way as you do everywhere else. It's not a, a voodoo, you know? You, 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 you do something that makes sense economically. And you don't have to link it with aid, other than maybe, like my friend here, was building a school. Uh, also, there are two sides of corruption. There's the one who gives corruption, and then the one who receives. There's a tendency to focus on the receiver, rather than the one who gives. We can create rules that uh, hamper our company's ability to give bribes by defining bribes more clearly. I think so. Uh, Kasim Kulimba, Professor Kulimba there, uh, my good friend, you could have given my talk. We agree so much, and I agree 200% with everything you said. Uh, but I think that we are in Norway, and we want to, we want to do something, so our focus should be, how, what can we do from Norway? We can't change what the Tanzanians or the Guineans are doing. Yes. Thank you. If you want it. You can Anyone? I'll take the, I'll take the big one. <laughs> uh, just a few quick things. Unfortunately, there is no correlation between the democracy and fast growth. I mean, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, they were not democratic when they grew, grew fast. So it's, you know, many people have tried to find the correlation, but they cannot find it. But also, uh, dictatorships or autocratic regimes, regimes which have been complete disasters. That's why there's no correlation. Uh, it was also said that in order to be, become rich, you have to produce finished goods. And that's not really the case either. I mean, it's Norwegian experience, as was pointed to. We export uh, unprocessed fish, because it, processing it in Norway is really destroying value, at least some of it because the processing cannot really pay the kind of uh, wages that we want in this country. So therefore, 
frozen fish is exported to China, it's uh, processed, uh, processed there and then re-exported back to Norway. And that makes sense. Investors, what they look for is profit. Pure and simple. I mean, what is the investment project? Does it look profitable? Uh, also assessing the kind of risks that are, that are involved. And there are lots of risks if, if you want to invest in Africa or anywhere else. And definitely Norfund should be stopped from doing uh, stupid things. I mean, it's a, it's a government agency. So uh, if they do uh, things which are counter to its mandate, which is helping to create development in Tanzania and elsewhere, they, they should be stopped from doing that. And I'm really, uh, I'm really shocked to hear that they are uh, allowed to take over the, the farms of small-scale uh, rice growers in Kenombero. So uh, that is not good at all. And then there was an issue of uh, not give aid with, with strings attached, or conditional aid as it's been called. Last week, the, our Minister of uh, Development Cooperation, Heike Holmos, was here, and uh, presenting uh, white paper number 25, very ambitious goals for what Norwegian aid should ex uh, achieve in terms of changing the distributional uh, income distribution in poor countries. That was part of the agenda, as far as I could hear. And how can we do that? How can we think that we can achieve that with Norwegian Development Aid without having some strings attached? Uh, of course, we could only give to countries which want, to, you know, clearly are having a policy that will improve the distribution, but there aren't very many of those countries around. And so there are many ways you can do it. You can try to give it to projects which do something with distribution. But we know there's something called uh, fungibility. You think you're giving money to a school, but then the government is taking its own, mo own money out of that school, and the money it had planned to use for that school, it's used it for something else. A new plane for the president, or whatever. So we don't really know, even if we send money to us one project, we don't need it, really know what that aid is buying in the end. And I've been told there is a... I'm not able to, to pronounce it in, the, in this Kenyan language, but they have a, a proverb saying that it's easy to deceive a foreigner. <laughs> and I think very often the, the local authorities, they know much better what's happening in this development project and so on than what the aid the donors really think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any yeah. more comments from the panel? Yeah. Please uh, take uh, 10, 10 or 20 seconds. Thank you. I just wanted to make one quick comment. Um, there was a, a slogan in the United States that government is not the solution, government is the problem. Um, and, but, but the problem remains that you can't make enough money from poor people. And especially in the health, education, and other critical sectors. And so it has to be government which funds national education and teacher training, as well as health and, and, and medical workers and so on. And there is an appropriate place for development assistance for governments which legitimately cannot afford those things on their own. And um, the, I, for the life of me, cannot see anything wrong with helping to fund university sectors in African countries. I think that's a wonderful use of of development assistance, and there are many other examples. And so, another trite phrase is please don't throw out the baby with the bath. Well, I couldn't agree more <laughs> with that last one. Um, I just want to, to um, pose a question to all of us What is international solidarity? What is solidarity with Africa? what's the next generation solidarity? Because I think there is so much interest in trying to change the world and to work in different ways to do that. But I think we, all of us, need to ask that question to ourselves. What do we think is international solidarity, in, in particular in relation to Africa? Thank you very much. Uh, just to build on that solidarity part, I, uh, I want to again talk about the aid, the importance of aid, uh, in the sense that 
Today, infrastructure that is built in Africa by the Chinese is quite visible. People are happy about it. But uh, coming to the western edge, also the soft part of, 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 of development, where you come in uh, the human development part, uh, bringing institutions together in multi-stakeholder approach, and uh, that has demonstrated quite uh, uh, a number of successes, so it is uh, still important. And I think that is uh, something that needs a lot of understanding. I think it's Two words about conditionality. Yeah, I think um, it's when the World Bank lends money to someone, they don't demand. Uh, they don't demand. When the World Bank demands lends money to someone, they don't demand human rights or women in positions and so on. They demand three things: liberalisation, privatisation, and deregulation. That's been been done for 30 years now. And the problem with this is that it is between the private and the public that corruption comes. It's when yours and becomes mine. And so after six years studying the World Bank with a huge group, we came to a conclusion that the World Bank creates corruption, creates problems, is a part of the problem of the solution. And this makes it, this thing intrinsically problematic. So I think the good story is that I think the World Bank and the IMF is on the way out of Africa. Um, corruption, again. Uh, well, the good news is it, it is uh, going down. It's not fashion anymore in Africa. Uh, be sure of that. Uh, another thing is that uh, keep in mind that uh, Turkey, Greece, Spain, Italy are more corrupt than many African nations. So. So we shouldn't be uh, focused much about that corruption, or, or if we should focus about that, is as uh, the speaker in the blue jacket said, not only about the one who receives, but also the one who gives. So uh, my friend Alex, uh, my answer to your question is that, I know you are very critical of Chinese investments in Africa, I am as well, uh, in the sense that, uh, as the ambassador said, they bring a lot of Chinese workers and not empower African workers. So. Um, what uh, European investors should do then is to counter that and invest in African workforce and then employ them for, for the sake of uh, the growth for everybody. And inequality, well, even in Norway there are inequalities and Africa is in an early stage of economic development, economic growth. So uh, we see there's a problem, uh, as I said, 100 million out of a, uh, of a billion are like you and I. But uh, as I said again, it's just a start. We are on the verge of taking off. The plan is not only ever. So, thanks.